<laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us tonight for an event with Kwame Mbalia and Tracy Dion. We are so excited to host these incredible authors. They are truly some of Flyleaf's absolute favorites. My name is Talia. I'm the events manager here at Flyleaf. Um, if you're new to the store, we are a general interest, new and used independent bookstore located in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, we have huge sections for both adults and kids, uh, new and used. And if you haven't been here, we really encourage you to check it out if you're local. Um, we host a bunch of virtual events since COVID. We do about one or two a week and you can check out our full schedule by clicking on the Flyleaf Books profile at the top of your screen and you can check out everything we have coming up. Um, we are also now open for browsing. So again, if you're local, you can come by Monday through Saturday, 11 to 5. And if you're not local, you can shop online. Um, our The link just below our faces is to buy Tracy and Kwame's books, but you can also explore our website in general. All right, so tonight we are hosting this event in partnership with the Chalpaho Public Library, and we have the library's incredible director, Susan Brown, here, and she's going to introduce our authors tonight. Hey, thanks, Talia. And hey to um, Jamie and Elise and everybody over at Flyleaf. Um, I am indeed Susan Brown, director of the Chapel Hill Public Library and a huge fan of both of these authors that we have here tonight. Um, so I was thrilled to be asked. Um, and yes, I am broadcasting from Chapel Hill Public Library. And I just want to take a second and say on behalf of the staff here and the books, and the big trees in the children's room and all the comfy chairs by the windows. We miss you all so much. We love you and we miss you so much. Um, and we look forward to the day that we can throw open our doors and welcome you back in. We don't know when that is, um, but we miss you all. Um, in the meantime, we can gather on Zoom with our great friends at Flyleaf, at Flyleaf and great authors like these that we have tonight. So I am going to quickly introduce these two wonderful authors and then turn it over to them for a chat. So Kwame Mbalia is the New York Times bestselling author of Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky, for which he received a Coretta Scott King Award. The book was also named to many, many best of the year list, um, including Publishers Weekly, the Chicago Public Library, and the New York Times. The second book in the trilogy is Tristan Strong, De Tristan Strong De Destroys the World. There it is. Kwame lives with his wife and children in Raleigh, North Carolina, where he is currently working on the third book about Tristan and that wonderful cast of characters, my favorite, of course, being Gumbaby. Um, Tracy Dion is a writer and a second generation fangirl. She grew up in central North Carolina, where she devoured fantasy books and Southern food in equal measure. After earning her master's degree in communication and performance studies from UNC Chapel Hill, Chapel Hill, go heels, Tracy worked in live theater, video game production, and K through 12 education. Uh, when she's not writing, Tracy speaks on panels at science fiction and fantasy conventions. She really is a fangirl, y'all, I'm just saying. Um, she reads fanfic. She apparently uh, sets up puppy play dates and she keeps an eye out for ginger flavored everything. And also Legend Born was just recently awarded a Coretta Scott King Award, a Coretta Scott King Award as well. So y'all didn't come here to see me or hear from me. You came here to see Tracy and Kwame. So I'm gonna hand it over to them. That intro was so good. I know, like, I'm practically tearing up. It's I just, know, I was like, Kwame did do all that. It's, what are you talking about? We're, here, we're talking about you, okay? That's what no. this is about. We're here to talk about, oh, wait, y'all didn't come here to see my face. You came here to, hold on. We came here, we were talking about each other. He showed up and was like, here, let me just put this book up while I talk. And I'm like, I could do that too. This is, a, this is how the conversation is going to go. This is what we're going to, this is what we're going to do. This is where we're at. Um, so I love that. I'm just going to say I love that this is a Chapel Hill hosted 
event uh, because the book, of course, Legendborn takes place in Chapel Hill, it takes place on campus. And that just makes my heart like super warm uh, to see that. And I see some, some UNC people are in the chat, which is really cool. So that just shout out for Chapel Hill host for a Chapel Hill book. And this almost, oh, one more thing is like, this almost wasn't officially set at UNC. Um, I don't know why, I think I was just like hesitant to at first and it was all researched to be UNC, like all the research had been done and I called it something else. And then like, I don't know, right at an inconvenient time, like line edits or something, I was like, this should be UNC Chapel Hill. I should call it what it is. Like it is that school. And so I had to go through and do like a really, a UNC, we called it the UNC pass and go through and make sure that like all my facts were a hundred percent and like walking distance between places was right. And like, we had a lawyer review. It was just like a whole process, but now I'm so glad because now all these like Chapel Hill connections and keep coming up. Yeah, it's a, uh, I mean, it's a tough thing setting something so um, emotionally resonant uh, in an area that we're familiar with, an area that we love, right? Because mm -hmm. there are, um, we we pull off a lot of Band-Aids, right? We pull mm -hmm. off um, a lot of scar tissue and expose a lot of things. And so um, I think something that you tackle very wonderfully in Legendborn is something that we constantly try to get the country to grapple with. And that is, what is the legacy of, our past, right? The, the past mm -hmm. of this country. Um, how is it? Um, I mentioned scar tissue. How how have we layered so much scar tissue over it that it just looks and feels like normal skin when there are still wounds that have not healed yet covering it, right? So mm -hmm. it's um it's something that you've done spectacularly. And I have to ask you this: that has it's totally irrelevant to everything oh, that yeah. I just said. Uh, um, how many author copies do you have? Oh, I don't know. Um, a lot, a lot, right? A lot. A lot. Just... I need to do. I need to do a giveaway. But like, oh. I got. A, I know I got a case, so that's twenty. So, but I don't have uh, like all twenty here. I think I did do something, but uh, like a giveaway, a small something. But like, I need to do a real one and give away some of these and sign them. Um, Tracy, so I'll do that. Tracy, what? Let's do a giveaway. Ah, yeah, we should. Yeah, we should do a giveaway. Yes. We should yes. do one. Because yeah. I have too many. Look, do you see right there? I have a lot of yeah, copies. I, I, I believe you. I don't see it, but I believe you. I think I saw oh. it. <laughs> I'm not messing up my, I'm not changing my camera view because. I know, you know I was like, why well, I need to move? But like, you can no, see this, is... this way. You can see I have quite a lot. Yes, yes. And um, I even have like my Alcrate pen up there. Like I have a lot and I have a few Alcrate editions too, but I'm not gonna give those away because they're special. Okay, stay tuned. We are going to do a Tracy and Kwame giveaway. You yes. will get a package of Tristan and Brie and they will commiserate and uh, do wonderful, fantastical things together in uh your literary space so stay tuned yeah, for that well, yeah it's gonna be like that's the, the best stack i don't know why we haven't thought about this i don't know it's like they get great stuff and we get to purge our bookshelves i it's like just y'all don't know but like kwame and i <laughs> we go back a little ways we used to like write we used to work on our books like side by side in like coffee shops when I, at least I don't know what was going on in his laptop, but my, I felt like everything was a mess on mine. I remember one day I like turned to you and I was like, what if I just, what if I just give up on this scene? It'll be fine, right? And I remember, I'm like, this is too hard. And I remember Kwame just like gave me, this is his look, he was like, Like, just like, no, you're not going to do that. You're not going to give up. Like, what are you, you're just frustrated. It's fine. And look at you, and look at you, and look at you. I know, I know. But I'm just like laughing because there were these, there were definitely some moments where I was like, oh, I don't know what's going on. And then you were working on Tristan. It was, it was a time. And what I remember, I remember uh, coming to you and talking about like, I didn't know what to do with Tristan too. Like, I didn't know yes. what to do with it. I didn't know what we were going to do, I don't know what Tristan was going to do. And I remember pitching something to you and the story turned out to be not that at all. Like 
it was completely <laughs> different because I was just fumbling at straws and I was just like, what if Tristan does this? And you were like, okay, Kwame, that sounds good. And I was like, no, but it's not. And not we that. were just we were just two writers <laughs> in the Starbucks having a breakdown. We 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 really were. <laughs> like, like, like I love it. And that like that was gotta be like two years ago mm -hmm. now pre Tristan one even coming out so mm -hmm. now look at us New York Times best-selling authors look at us look we're at like us that, we're like at that Paul Red. exactly yeah. that's look that's, at us. that's us but black that's really what it is it is it is us but black with, <laughs> with like and we're not drinking we have just like exactly amazing, look at us like <laughs> books look at look us, at us. <laughs> <laughs> look at, look at. what's funny is oh, I, have, oh my gosh. I have um right now on uh i think i downloaded it i have two pictures um i found the picture of uh you and me outside of the chapel hill public library when we met in person for the first oh, time that was the first time we met yes yes i have that yeah. picture i'll have to i'll have to send it to you um yeah we should post it we should post it as long as it looks right I I'm, I will send it to you and you can post it if you want. Okay. All right. All right. That was a good day because I remember I was like, I got to go to this event. And then I think I think we just like two-stepped. We, like, we did. Hello. We did. <laughs> After the event, we didn't say hello. It was like, it was like, it was the, uh, um, oh my God, what is the gift? It's Whitney Houston and another singer who's winning an award. And they just point at each other and they're like, yeah, ah! and then we just two-stepped to each other. And it was, that was it. That's, that's how the it connection was, so was made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was at Chapel Hill Library. Full circle for yeah. real though, actually. Yes. Like, this is a good moment. Okay, we were, let's Let's talk books because okay. we said we were gonna talk books, and then um, we were gonna do a lot, a little bit longer of a Q and A than we had planned because mm -hmm. there's so many people here. Yes, like I'm looking, like there's a lot of people, and there's a lot like of people. I see there's some like the cell cell stands are here. I'm scared I see of them. The big crew, I see a lot. I, I I see some Alice folk in here, which mm -hmm. is wonderful. Like mm -hmm. big ups to Alice people. Um, so yeah, let's talk with the book. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's let's just talk about it. Not, I'm not, like, not. I'm like, I feel like I'm like the substitute teacher who's like, all right, we need to get back on track with what's happening in the class. <laughs> no, I, just, <laughs> I wasn't here. <laughs> I think I think something that is uh, something that's really important to me about your book uh, is. Um, it's not even in the book per se, um, but it's about how the book came together um, because I got to read, you know, like the first, what was it? Like the first five chapters of the book. Yeah. Like it was like months before it came you, out. You read it. I'm not even, you might've even read it when it was, um, when it was first person past tense. Like you might have even read it before I changed tenses. Like you read it mm -hmm. very early, and like mm -hmm. the scene between Cell and Bree in at the quarry was much longer. Mm -hmm. It was this whole big thing. It was mm -hmm. like a huge amount of interaction with more magic and stuff. You read that very early, and I remember snatching it back from you twice. Yes, you yoinked that thing so quickly. Yeah. I was like, you were like, nope, and I was like, excuse me, I was invested yeah, and. It's, but that, but like, that's what writers do, right? Like, you send something to your friend, and then you're still working on it, and then you're like, "Never mind, don't read this one. Read the next one. <laughs> like, don't read, click, like, or delete that file. This is the this is the real one you need to read." You know, right? But I think I pulled it twice from you. And what's um, amazing, and I think I texted this to you or DM'd it or something. However, our multiple channels of communication work, um, and it was like what I read was great. Right, like, and and I know, you know, the authors of our own work. We're like, eh, you know, it, it was all right, right? It wasn't, you know, it was okay, but um, it was great. And then I read the final, and I was like, I was like, oh my gosh, like I didn't understand, right? I didn't understand how you could take something that was already so good and then break it down, rip it apart. Mm -hmm piece it back mm -hmm. together, stress yourself out on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. And it'd be so much, like it's be so fantastic. Like that, 
knowing what you went through and knowing what you wrote uh, and how you edit it and how you revised um, that, I think that makes everything that has happened with legend born, the success, the awards, the lists, it has, it makes it that much sweeter because I know what you went into or what you put into it. Yeah, so talk about you. all of that. Thank you for saying that. Cause I feel like that is, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's I, only the people who were closest to me during that time. And I actually kept a really small circle of people who read legend born. So I really wasn't sure what it was, how it was going to land. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, that's, there's blood, sweat, tears all over that book. I mean, that I went over it and over it and over it and over it. Um, and I feel so fortunate that my editorial team and my creative team at Simon Schuster supported me in tearing this book up and doing it over again until it was right. I mean, there were times when I was like, I know they are not happy with what I just did during these past pages. <laughs> I'm like, I know they're not happy that I'm still tweaking, you know, this sentence just to get the the sound right in my ear. Um, and the process really was, uh, you know, getting tighter and tighter and tighter about my themes and also a, understanding that I was writing a mystery. Like once that clicked, because I don't think it clicked that I was writing a mystery with multiple mysteries embedded in it for a while. And then once I realized that, then I was able to go back and think about things in terms of clues and threads and information. Um, and I think one of the other things that was really important to me was that I world build as we go. And in some places, I think I'm like successful at that. And other places I'm like, oh, and like now, of course, as a writer, I'm like, oh, I wish I did that, did that differently. But I really, really wanted to be able to world build as Brie went along and so that you were learning things with her. Um, and that is really where a lot of the work came in was like, how do I know what information Brie needs to hear when? And then once I got all of that, I had, they gave, they made sure I had enough time to do what I call almost like just like a lyricism pass. Like I went back through and I said, okay, all the stuff is there. And technically this book could go to print right now, but does, you know, let me comb through these sentences and make sure that they sound the way that I want them to sound. I was a poet before I started really focusing on writing fiction. Um, and I used to write scripts for plays and I used to write other scripts for like dialogue meant to be said out loud. And so I think I, I have a good inner ear for how I want language to sound and, and, and flow and banter and stuff like that. And I remember I did a pass just for that, which felt like I don't know. It almost felt like a luxury. Like it was really, I know that not everybody has that. And I know that I also created that time by not sleeping and, uh, you know, pulling all nighters. And like, there was a lot of unhealthy work days in there that I'm not going to celebrate like that work style. But, you know, I made sure that I felt that this was the best possible book it could be. Um, and it took a lot, it took a lot of tearing apart and putting back together and a lot of, um, just to get it all to work, a lot of reviewing little details to make sure that everything linked up so that when you got to the end of the book, you felt like every mystery that I had really opened up got resolved. Like sure, there's threads that the next book will deal with, but I wanted everything, every single like sort of door that I opened really like fully opened for it to be closed. And that took a lot of work. And look at you, step toe <laughs> in the bestseller. <laughs> New York Times bestseller. Come on. The step toe is so wild to me. Um, <laughs> it's just because it's, you know, like I, I love the, the, the space and the acknowledgement that these awards give. Like I can see your honor plaque behind you there, Mr. Craig Scott King. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, as you know, uh, it's not always the genre, you know, wins the day there mm -hmm. um and it's it's it says a lot i think about where we are and also what our craft level is um and where we are as a society that that people are like oh maybe genre is doing something genre has always been doing it it's just that now we're seeing a lot more recognition for it in literary spaces and in educational spaces too which is pretty cool i have a random question for you sure have you ever thought about writing middle grade I have, mm -hmm. and I just, I feel like I don't quite 
understand it. Mm-hmm. I think my voice tends higher, like it tends mm-hmm. older. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've tried, I actually tried to write, I wrote, um, like, should I say this? No, don't get in trouble. Yeah, I don't want to get in trouble. Never mind. Okay, so I won't say this, but um, <laughs> I'm like, I'm get I know people in the chat are like, oh, Kwame, what are you yeah, doing? Yeah, yeah, no, but you're right. Like, I shouldn't say it. But the, but I but I wrote a project where the main character was um, like 12 or 11. And by the end, I could just feel it. I could just feel it was edging up. And so I think it's it's really hard. No, it's hard. I feel like people don't understand. Like, it's really hard to be able to give to show the depth that characters that age absolutely have, keep the momentum going, keep it short. You, the economy of language that y'all have. <laughs> I'm over here like, well, I could have said that in one sentence, but they're going to let me do it in two. <laughs> and like middle grade doesn't work like that. Um, so I don't know. I think I would, I mean, I think I could if I, if I studied it uh, and really spent some long time staring at mentor text and stuff, but See, I feel the same way as you do about YA. Like, really? I do. I do. It's like every time I try to start a YA, writing a YA, it's like I feel like I could get so much more. Um, I can be so much more dynamic if I if this was if it was a middle grade mm-hmm. character um, mm-hmm. who who was narrating the events, um, whose eyes we were. I feel like I could see you know, the world better through their mm-hmm. eyes or, mm-hmm. or or it just ends up, you know, I feel like it's an adult, right? Like it's an adult yeah. story. Yeah. And I, if there's one thing that I don't want to do, it's to be like, all right, this is a YA. And it's like, but it's, you know, completely written like an adult or whatever, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, the character feels much too old. So I don't know. It's something, you know, that I have to, uh, as you say, you know, read a lot of, of mentor texts. Um, a mess. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> but yeah i feel i feel the same way i feel the same way as you do um yeah. it's like well it's okay to have a home base voice mm-hmm. right like i think a lot of authors do have like just like a home base like that's like if i were to wake up and just start writing right now uh, you know off of a two-word prompt i know my voice would ring ya it's just I, weird. I just wonder if it's based off of something that we've internalized something that we've um captured at that particular stage of our life or whatever, Mm -hmm. because there's something in me that always feels like in the stories that I write, I want to rebel against um, adults, just like the, the Mm -hmm. um, anonymous adult and the the way that the rules are catered and and, and set by adults. I just want to rebel against them. You know, kids, I want to write, you know, in the vein of the the show recess, you know, I want to write Mm -hmm. um, Goonie style, you know, I I want to write, uh, books where it's kids and they're on an adventure and it could be something, you know, something small, something quiet in their attic, or it could be something fantastical, yeah, but it's, yeah. it's kids kind of rebelling against the structure of the world that's, is, that has been arrayed against them, you know? Yes. Yes. And that's interesting. If I'm trying to think about like, what, if I, what's the thing I'm always writing? I think I'm always writing the character who's more than she thinks she is. And the character who is, uh, yeah, who's like coming of age in w- without knowing that's what she's doing. Like she's she's on a mission. She has a mission, but like mm-hmm. along the way, we're watching her come of age, and then by the end, she's more than she could have ever imagined she could be. Like I like I feel like that's the journey that I'm always wanting, and I think mm-hmm. and I see how that could be middle grade, of course, obviously. Um, but I I feel like my execution is always gonna like want that person to be like 15, 16, 17, mm-hmm. um, and to be able to like see that they would go into adulthood a complete like they would go into adulthood in this like incredibly powerful way Mm -hmm. and like I'm setting them up for that um is like what I always feel like I'm trying to do but that's interesting I hadn't thought about like what I had internalized Mm -hmm. I mean I just I think that I was figuring myself out in such intense ways at that point I was an only child so Mm -hmm like being a teenage girl as an only child. And I was also a only child of a single mother. And like, I just spent a lot of time in my head and particularly figuring out who I was 
in those ages between like 14 and 17 and like 13 and 17, I remember I was just like a really, I was voraciously reading. I was constantly trying on different things to see what fit right and what felt good. And I was constantly writing my moody poetry. Like I just remember it was a really generative, intense time. And it was also a time when I was fully invested in stories, like really whole body into stories. And I think I went into adulthood and fell out of that for a time. Uh, and then came back to it because when I come back to that space where I'm like, I just want to live in a story world. I just want to be here and like explore and have fun. That does make me feel like I'm like 15 again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe, it's something, maybe it's something to do with that for me. I don't know. No. And it's, and, and I, and I agree. Like there's something for me, it's like, um, there's, um, this, this fracturing, right? Like this, this mental and emotional fracturing where, and fragmenting where, you know, you, the, the world as, you know, you, and, and speaking of, of a middle grade character, the world, as you know, it, it, it's starting to reveal itself. There's more, there's something deep inside that closet that leads to another world, right? Or there mm -hmm. is, um, just a slip of reality that can be peeled back and you'll see something, you know, wondrous or fantastical, or at least you want to, right? Like mm -hmm. you're at that, you're at that mm -hmm. point where um, you 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 want adventure, right? You're not right. you're not ready to change yet, but you, you the world is changing around you, and you want to experience that in some you know uh, uh, magnificent way. Um, yeah. And just like whenever I'm thinking about writing a story, it's always you know a character that's going on some type of like you said some type of journey, and that journey that they go on informs the change that they are looking for, right? Like it mm -hmm. informs the change in the world around. It's just when you think of how little I shouldn't say little how younger minds process and how they internalize and how you know they see the world around them, they rationalize it in ways that their mind understands, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's for me, I think I'm I'm always going to be stuck at that point in my life where I'm trying to figure out, you know, the world is is there's something there's something I don't know, uh, unimaginable about that idea that, you know, you are experiencing the world outside of your tiny little bubble for the first time. Yeah. What does it look like? Here's that snapshot, right? Like you never get to experience that again. Yeah. Um yeah. it's it's I don't know, it's 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 slightly humbling and I think I'm always seeking to write and to capture that moment. Yeah. As you're talking, I'm thinking about also the fact that like middle grade, that's around the age when you start when you start being responsible for things. Mm -hmm. And maybe you weren't before. Mm -hmm. But like now you're given early responsibilities, whatever those might look like. If it's like take care of your sibling or like get home on your own from the bus stop. Mm -hmm. or, you know, you can make your own sandwich, whatever it is. Like, I just feel like that is probably the time period also. And I think that's a common thing that I encounter when I'm reading middle grade is like people coming, like uh, kids coming up against responsibility. And what does that mean? What do they like? What are they, which of those do they resist and which mm -hmm. one on willingly? Um, yeah, this is, yeah, that's interesting. I'll give it, you know, <laughs> you'll be like, it'll be you or Mrs. Karen Strong who get my first middle grade. And I'll be like, please be nice to me. <laughs> We will. We absolutely. Maybe. I feel like Karen will be like, this is not a middle grade voice. Try again. I love you. <laughs> She's probably here right now laughing. It's true, Karen. <laughs> Karen, Karen is somewhere <laughs> cackling like, yes, yes, you know it. Yes. And like, you know what? Just for that, mm -hmm. we're going to do there. this. We're Put it out there. Out here too. You know mm -hmm. what? So we got we got all sorts of books that we can just put on display. Anytime I talk smack about any of my friends, I'll soften it. But oh, we just you just drag Bethany into it, just like just, Bethany. just yank her right into it. Why don't well, you we? Know let me let me talk about Bethany for a second because I one of the things that she and I get to talk about a lot is contemporary fantasy and what we're using it for, and and Tristan's contemporary fantasy too, right? Mm -hmm. Like. It, <clears throat> I just want to make sure that people understand <laughs> the power of this subgenre. It is, I love it. I love it, love it. And I, and I remember growing up wishing I was reading more of it where characters look like me and where the things that they're wrestling with actually also wrestled with the stuff that I had to deal with in the contemporary world. Because often what happens is contemporary fantasy will skew fantasy, really. And the actual, the things that contemporaries are so good at wrestling with 
love and relationships, identity, you know, racism, sexism, oppression, you know, like uh, fighting against systemic issues, like contemporaries will deal with that all day and all night. And fantasy will do it in ways that are only in, internal to its own fantasy structure. Like there's people with blue horns and they don't get the vote or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. but to actually have the contemporary issues that I just mentioned wrestle with fantasy in the same space and at the same level, like to hold both of those subgenre, those uh, the, the components of the subgenre in the same weight is really, really good. That's where the good stuff happens. And I feel like that, you know, it matters. I feel like, you know, Tristan does that. A Song Below Water does that. Legendborn was my challenge to myself to do that because mm -hmm. then when you're doing that, you can challenge all sorts of systems of power, mm -hmm. not just the magical hierarchy that you've built or the magical system of power, mm -hmm. but you can also challenge the systems of power that the reader is still living with right now. Like your reader is operating in a an intersection of systems of oppression and power. Like mm -hmm. we all are as humans on this planet. And like to be able to engage with that equally and also have a magic sword in the next scene, like the power that that has. Mm -hmm. like, and I just feel like, you know, that this, I want to see this be the rise of contemporary fantasy. And maybe it is a little bit, you know, and I don't mean urban fantasy because we can talk all day and all night about urban fantasy getting applied in weird ways. Like people call legend born urban fantasy. And I'm like, y'all know it takes place in the South on like mm -hmm. an almost suburban campus, but not really like there's, they're in the woods for like 30% of this book. This is not mm -hmm. urban fantasy. Um, so there's a difference there, you know, I don't know. That's my rant. <laughs> <laughs> he got got real personal there at the end. It's uh, it did it did. It, it, it's it, fine. It's well, it's true, you know. And like I, I think that urban, also urban fantasy, I think has some connotations. It's not just about race, but about like um, like a, a sort of an underworld type struggle, mm -hmm. and thought structure. And I'm just like, no, Legend Board mm -hmm. happened right next to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is not underworld. This is not a back alley and it has different tropes and that, you know, there's just a whole different vibe for that subgenre. Um, what I'm dealing with is actually the intersection of contemporary and, and fantasy fiction. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that where you um, see yourself kind of carving out your niche is in that space or is there, uh, I, think so. I mean, I've seen now, you know, this is a perfect segue to say that, uh, one of us on this screen has written, you know, for Star Wars. And so, <laughs> like, how how does that fit into your scope of, you know, the the Tracy Dion catalog? I mean, I'm going to be very, hmm. Mm. I, think I'm, I think I'm going to be very selective about the IP that I write for. Um, mm -hmm. Because what I want to do in IP space is not dissimilar to what I'm already doing in my original fiction um, mm -hmm. in terms of like, I know the type of stories I want to tell. And if the IP supports that, then I think we'll be, we'll be cool. You know, like mm -hmm. Star Wars, I literally wrote a story from the perspective of an ancient king. Oh, you did. And it was so good. And Thank I you. hate, I, it, no, you didn't let me finish. Okay, I said it was so good, and I hate that you came up with that idea because it's so great. And like, I don't even know what POV is. That is that a COV? Is like what you know? Hey. For the, yeah, it's like POV. Like I don't, I don't know. But you like invented a POV, and it's just I don't. I, it's great. If you guys have what, which you know, drop name, drop. What is the? Um, and I have this one too. Um, so this is from. Uh, from a certain point of view, The Empire Strikes Back is the 40th anniversary, um, 40 stories by 40 authors. Um, and yeah, they all the contributors have a story from the perspective of um, a minor character or an original character who is like um, sort of off the off to the side of the main plot of the movie. Um, and so, yeah, I decided I wanted to do the cave, the, the, the dark side evil cave on Dagobah. Um, and I gave it a whole arc. The, the, like the, the cave has like a, a character arc and like conflict and um you know it's a landform with a lot going on and i i'm so glad they let me do it but you know if you read legendborn and then you read virgins i feel like you can see like oh that's tracy like i'm i'm interested in multiplicity of voices i'm interested in 
history and how it affects today. Um, I love flirting with like the edges of sort of darkness and sinister stuff. Like, I no, love, I love that. No, really. Uh-huh. <laughs> no, Tracy likes that. No, I know. I'm a Gemini, and I'm like my, <laughs> my other twin is evil. Yes, like, I can feel it. Um, you know, like I, I actually, I used to be in this fan group, like fandom group, and there was another Tracy in the group, and it's spelled the same way. And uh, I think he was like, he was like lawful good Tracy or something, and I was lawful evil Tracy. And I was upset at first, but then I was like, no, that's right. Mm -hmm. No, I can see it. I can see it. That's a correct orientation, actually. Like, like, I would at least be able to point to the, like, reference in the back of the the evil manual about as to why things were happening. (laughs) I'd, like, have research books and be like, okay, look, if you look at exhibit A, this is why we're here. I'm I'm just following the text. Um, But... (laughs) But yeah, you know, I think that as long as the IP allows me to do my thing is what while playing in their world, then yeah. So you heard it here first, folks, the cave and the Virgin's Tracy story and um, from a certain point of view has more emotional resonance than some of your faves. It's cool. Just deal with it. Um, also, uh, from a certain point of view, a song below water. Uh, just south of home, legend born. All of these can be picked up at uh, Flyleaf Bookstore. So go ahead, s- click the link, start there, buy Tracy's book, and then go in and purchase some more and support some more, support some more black authors. Yeah. Um, there are fifty-one questions. Well, let's do it. How many of those are from the same person? Um, I don't know, but I'm ready. Let's dive in. I feel like let's... I feel like there's going to be a lot of there's a lot of sell content Mm -hmm. in this chat that i've seen coming by so i'm with it i'm with it i know i'm I'm gonna they're gonna ask sell questions i feel which is fine let's talk about it i'm gonna take notes all right um we need a moderator (laughs) no i'm definitely taking notes (laughs) talia we we kind of talked about what we're supposed to talk about (laughs) help moderator Oh no, oh, see, he left us. Abandon us. All right. Uh-oh. All right. If you're going to leave it in my hands, we are going to make it do what it do. Let's All right. Do it. Uh, question number one. No, I'm not asking that question. How dare you put that in my. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, All right. I guess I'll just start from the top. Sure. How do you get to know your characters? Are they inspired by people in your life? Or do they pop into your mind? Um, they pop into my mind, um, and then I flesh them out with people in my life. So anybody, there, there are very few. There's like one character in Legendborn that almost exclusively pulls from one person. Um, every every other character, if they are connected to someone that I know, or I'm using them for inspiration, it's an amalgamation. It's like two or three or four people, um, but uh and trivia that's the that's the dad her dad is like like 80 percent my dad <laughs> <laughs> do, so. do you have like um like mood boards or anything for like what the character looks like or do you just kind of sketch it out mm-hmm. as you go not really like i knew i like i i eventually created a pinterest board it, it's still up i think of legend born characters watch like all these people be like and where is it um where i just needed images of certain like aspects of the character the vibe you know like Mm -hmm. actually what helps me most picture the character is to is to assign like a song to them or a, a, a soundtrack like a track like there's like the Captain America Winter Soldier soundtrack. I talk about this all the time because I listen to it all the time. But the like the murder strut Bucky like Winter Soldier scream, like that gives me uh like hellhound vibes. That makes me think about like the energy of what it would be like to hunt. And that makes me think about cell and that makes me think about like certain fights in the woods and stuff like that. So I draw that's where I flush people out a lot too. Murder strut. 
Bucky. I did not make up the murder strut. <laughs> no, I just Bucky stands made up the murder strut. If you if you were to like go to TikTok and put in murder strut, I bet you'd find something. But murder. it's like <laughs> how he walks. Murder strut. Yeah. Is that like is it like you know how, what's what's a what's a you know what I'm gonna Google he has right like now. A swagger. He has like a hip swagger, and he's got the arm and the mask, and it's 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 a thing. I'm I not. What, I know what hips you're looking at. Murder if strut. We can, Bucky. If we can talk about Bucky, then we're gonna get off topic. <laughs> <laughs> the top the top Google result is how does one murder strut. I, well, a great question. It's a great question. Um, so the playlist, somebody asked if there's a playlist. There is a Legendborn soundtrack. If you go to um, Spotify under Owl Crate, and actually I've shared it a couple times on Twitter, but like Owl Crate asked me to create a playlist. And of course I'm extra. So I didn't just create a playlist. I created a Legendborn book soundtrack that starts with the like prologue and goes like through the book sort of like beat by beat. It's not exactly chapter by chapter, but it's like big event by big event um, in order. Um, so you can go check it out. I actually think it's a pretty good playlist. There is a Bucky King of Memes Tumblr. Uh, how does one murder strut? Mostly, mostly, you just lock your eyes on target when... <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that checks out. Mostly, you just lock your eyes on target. Tilt your chin down a bit. Channel see. all your rage and existential angst outwards and try yeah. to silently communicate that any person or immovable object that gets in your way is going to come down with a serious case of the grenades. A lot of it <laughs> is in the hips. Murder strut. That there is, you go. Murder strut. You're okay. right. This murder strut, Bucky. This is definitely how our conversation was always going to go. <laughs> you know, you had no hope. You had no hope. I'm going to turn it over to the official uh, moderator. So please rescue us from ourselves. So I was just going to say, I had a little technical difficulty. I got kicked out. And y'all were talking about fantasy genre and, you know, all of these things. And I come back on and it's murder strut. So murder I, I don't know yeah. where we are, but I love this place. We contain multitudes. That's right. Uh, someone put the soundtrack link. Maya, thank you, Maya. Put the soundtrack link in there. So go check it out. Okay. So questions. Um, and I love this function because people are like upvoting questions. And this next one, um, I, I will confess I'm married to a super nerdy PhD Arthurian studies Germanic guy. So the question here, and this could be him posing as Sarah, I don't know. <laughs> Sarah wants to know, um, when and how did, did your interest for Arthurian legends start? Um, I mean, I think uh, like a lot of a lot of 80s kids, certainly like Sword in the Stone was a very early influence. Um, Archimedes, there's um, that, that owl is amazing. It was, it was um, so good. He, He's so good. He's wonderful. Uh, and then uh, The Dark is Rising by Susan Cooper, which I talk about in my author's note, that series uh, was the first contemporary fantasy series that I read. Uh, it started, I think, in the 60s. It's a five book series uh, set in England and also Wales. And it brings Arthur into the present. It brings the legend of Arthur's um, the legend's consequences, I should say, into the present day. And that was the first time I'd seen someone treat the legend as though it was a legend in common thought, but also real, and then have it be brought forward. And so that there are elements of it that almost felt like a sequel to Arthur, but also it wasn't the main story. Actually, the main story is not revolving around Arthur and the Knights, but they're important. And I felt like that was the first time I thought like, could you do that? Can you do that? And that was when I was nine. So, you know. <clears throat> we, can talk, we, can, we can talk about that series for the rest of the evening, because that is one of my favorite uh, series. Like it's, it is the darkest rising is in terms of foundational, you know, fantasy, you know, text for me, yeah, it is, yeah. it is up there with token because um, it, again, you know, I like to talk about the, the, 
the system of rules that you know when you're writing from a, you know a middle grade point of view right the mm -hmm. the a system of rules that you don't quite understand but you are supposed to fit into and and you know learn as you go or whatever and there was there's a lot of that in that series right like you don't know you know um is it what's is it will is that his name will the, Stanton, yeah. Yeah, yeah like will just walks into a whole mess you know a whole mess and is expected to and instantly slot himself into the role of an old one. And I'm like, and you know, he's, he, you know, he's all of a young kid, a young boy or whatever, you know? He wakes up, it's his birthday. You yes. Know, it's the 11th son or this, this, I think it's like 11th the son. Seventh, seven. The seventh son yeah. of a seventh son. And he wakes up on his birthday and like the whole world is different. The world is frozen. His family members are frozen in like almost in time, but everything else is working and he's the only person walking around. And I just remember that scene being like, that's contemporary fantasy. You, mm -hmm. It's your birthday, you go to sleep, you're excited, you wake up, the world is frozen and you don't know why. And you have to walk out into the world and it's your normal neighborhood. And you're like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. And that's when you find out, oh no, actually you're this magical being that you didn't know that happened because of today. And like, you know, she, um, and also, I will before we move on. <clears throat> uh, Bron Davies, so like Bron, that character that gets mm -hmm. introduced in The Great King, <clears throat> which is an amazing and my favorite. It's my favorite book. Bron is very much like sort of an ins a, a tiny bit of an inspiration for Cell. And then his last name Davies uh, is a. There's a nod to that in Nick. Nick mm -hmm. in my book is Davis. So mm -hmm. I think so. That that's. Uh... Book two and book four. So book two is where we meet Will. Mm -hmm. uh, and book four is where we meet Bran, I believe, because the book three is the Green Witch, which is a whole nother, mm -hmm. like, the Green Witch absolutely scared me to death the first time I read it. I was like, that is, you know, horrifying. Everything, you know, when I just, I remember the, the scene in which uh, mm -hmm. Will... And uh, is, it, is it Mary? Is that what they call him? The the old the Will's yeah. mentor. Yeah, Merlin. The Merlin. Mer yeah, the the Merlin character. I just remember them. They learn something, some factoid, and then they run off the cliff and they dive into the ocean to swim down to like talk with you know like the Green Witch or whatever. And it's just like that scene haunted my dreams for weeks or whatever. But book two where we meet Will and book four where we meet Bron. I think those two um, books. Uh, they really cemented the idea of, of the characters that I try to write where you have, Bron is just, he's such a great character, right? Like everything, all time. everything that he has inherited, everything, uh, his appearance, everything that, you know, it's like the weight of the world is on his shoulders. He has this legacy that he has to deal with. Um, and he just wants to be a kid with a dog, you know, yeah, and it's, I know. and he's, but he's like short tempered. And like when he gets together with the other kids at the end who like all the groups come together, he's just like, he's like, okay, whatever. I'm used to being the hero. I, if I have to be, and mm -hmm. these kids showed up and what do they know? And like the dynamic, anyway, we're going to talk about Susan Cooper forever, but the, there, I would read it. I would read it again and like still find things in it. And also, I think it was pretty progressive um, mm -hmm. when I look back at when it was written, sixties and seventies. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What what other questions do we have? Let's see. Um. Mm -mm. There's one that's like, what's your views on the development of the Y of YA in the past several years? <laughs> that's a hard question. Um, I think I could speak in a limited way to it because I want to make sure we get through a lot of the other questions too. But um, I mean, I think YA as an age category is asking itself. Uh, a lot more questions than it used to. Um, I think there are more voices who are elevated in positions to ask those questions. Um, and I think readers are savvier than ever. And, you know, they, the, the young readers in particular, they don't, they don't, a lot of them don't read mess. Mm -hmm. They just don't want it. And their, their mess meter is well, well attuned. <laughs> 
And I love that. It's a challenge to write and admit you, you have to keep up with, you know, with, uh, you know, quote unquote, the kids these days, but like the, the readers who are young, the target audience of YA, like they're smart, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're smart and they're discerning and they know what represent, they know a lot of them, not all of them, of course, but like a lot of them know what representation matters and how, it, what it means. Um, and that, you know, they're start, they are at the point where they've been reading why long enough that they can see the patterns that didn't push the genres any further. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm like just speaking from people who have been tagging me in post and talking to, I talked to high schoolers earlier today. I'm like, these kids are sharp. And if you think you can show up with some mess, with some like late nineties sword and sorcery mess, like mm -hmm. they will not read it and they will tell you that you can do better. Like this is, I can do better with my time. And so mm -hmm. I think you go on book talk and you can see that a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So I do think that the, the cat, the age category and the voices who are speaking up now um, and even the readers are asking, asking YA to be more. And I think that's that, that demand that YA continue to, um, uh, be smart, inclusive, challenging its genres and even its age category sometimes. Um, I think that's getting louder is what I could say. Whether or not that's affecting publishing and publishers, I can't speak to that. That's part. a whole other story. But, but I think in terms of like conversations, it's getting louder. I think eventually the publishers will see where the, where the audience is wanting YA to go and probably follow that but it does take some money to make um, make publishing listen up. Um, but yeah, I think like in terms of connecting with your audience, I'm sure you're able to connect um, in totally different ways than YA authors were, you know, 10 years ago. Um, I'm just thinking of like the growing um, power of like BookTube and now BookTok, um, which just weren't around when, you know, I was in high school and reading YA. Yeah. Um, sorry about the, the technical difficulties. I kept getting back on and then it had turned my microphone off and I couldn't turn it back on. So I think we're good now. <laughs> um, I have a question here from Anisha who says, Tracy, there seems to be an analysis that can be drawn from your conceptualizations of community, in particular, white versus black spaces and human versus ancestral spaces. How did you use those dichotomies to reconcile your experience as a black woman in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, or generally? I know that's kind of a complicated question, but. Yeah, goodness. Yeah. Um, I'm reading it to make sure I'm very academic. All... Yeah, I know, which I love. Like, shout out to academics. Um, so there seems to be analysis that can be drawn from conceptualizations of community, in particular white versus black spaces. Yeah, so I think I'll, what I'll, I'll start with the white versus black state spaces and I might end there too, um, mm -hmm. for now. Like, how did these dichotomies, uh, how did I use these dichotomies to reconcile your experience? Um, so I don't know if I use those dichotomies to reconcile my experience. I think that as a student at UNC, it was very, I mean, I grew up often being the sole black face in white spaces, um, both in school environments or at the bus stop or certain classes or whatever. Um, and it continued at UNC. Um, the thing that made it different was that it was such a large population. And yet I was still in these types of circumstances where it was like one or two faces or whatever. Um, and I think the, you know, I don't, I don't know that there's a reconciliation that I was seeking or that I even found. I think the way that I navigated it and what made me feel, um, that these two different spaces were something I wanted to write about, um, was the discovery that this, that navigating that space was actually a skill. Once I realized that I wasn't you know, that, that I was developing skills to navigate and survive in those spaces, then I became interested and wanted to write about what that looks like. And I don't think that it's a good thing that I have to come up with survival skills for such circumstances. Um, but I do think it's an added amount of labor that I, I am um, always impressed with how Black people um, have found ways to survive. And um, we've had to, and we, we've we've been um, we've been in situations where we've it's been demanded. And there's been situations you walk in knowing you're going to have to 
to navigate that space differently. So I wanted to spend some time in the book uh, talking about what that looks like and how you have choices about what you can do as a Black person in white in a predominantly white space. It's interesting. Some readers are very much like, Bree's great because she takes no crap and she speaks up to racist. And I was like, it's interesting because I don't know that a lot of Black readers are catching it that way. Like, Bree does speak up to racists and racism, but there are other times when she doesn't. And she makes a choice not to because she looks around and says, like, is this a place where I can do that? And I think that that's the thing that I would also draw people's attention to is that she has an opportunity many times to speak up and doesn't or she speaks differently or she modifies what she says or she, you know, like there's all these different things that she's doing, uh, this added level of work that's an undercurrent when she goes to the lodge or when she's around legend board that she's having to figure out how to deal with that. Um, and it's just an, a, it's a, it's like a second level mission that's just running all the time underneath her main mission. And she didn't ask for that mission, but she has to deal with racism and it's a form of antagonism that just gets in her way as she tries to do her thing. She's trying to figure out what, why her mom died, but racism as in the real world just gets in her way <laughs> on a daily basis in spaces she didn't ask for it by people she didn't care to meet by people she doesn't want to be friends with it still is an obstacle for her and something she has to navigate so that kind of answers the question a little bit but yeah let's see yeah talia you're you're we lost your mic again Um, but Tracy, I would just to kind of piggyback on what you were saying. I find it interesting that, um, it's, uh, I don't know. It's almost like a passive trait, right? Like a passive buff. Mm -hmm. If you think about it in gaming terms, right? Like you always have this yeah. little active mini map, you know, in your mind. And it's just like, you know, you're walking around and all of a sudden like, dang, like that's, you know, there's some racist, some racism, right? There's a big pile oh, of racism oh, and you try and, weird. You know, you just you're trying to navigate it around, uh, navigate around it, and it's like, you know, um, you know, you mentioned you, you likened it to swimming against the current, which I think is a great um, analogy because it's just exhausting, right? Like it is a constant battle to move to stay in place, like in this country, um, and and especially you know as you know a black person in the south, as a as a black woman in the south, you know, it is um, there's less of a veneer, right? There's less of a shiny plastic coating covering up the racism, right? It's not disguised. It's just here. It's in your face. It's a it's a monument. It's a street sign. It's a school name. It's a flag, right? That's just on your neighbor's uh, lawn. And it's so bumper, it's... Bumper sticker. Yeah. And it's just like you're constantly cataloging that. And there's a little... Um, you know, racism meter in the in the background. It's just dee -dee 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 -dee, as you're you know driving along. Like, that's racist. That's racist. That's racist. I know that's racist. I'm not sure if that's racist, but I can't put the emotional energy into figuring it out yet. So I'm just gonna keep it moving. And that's what I think. You know, you were talking about with Bree. It's like sometimes it's just in your face, and you have no choice but to you know to tell it to move to get out of your way. And other times it's just like it's so exhausting. I'm just gonna sidestep it and keep going. And you know, you know, and I'm going to internalize it. And there's going to be an interiority and like a process of like mm -hmm. wrestling with um, all the emotions that that brings. You know, there's a part where Brie is like, you, she's feeling rage and shame and it, there's an impotency to her rage. She wants to do something with it, but she just, she knows she can't and she has to deal with it. And she knows that the consequence of speaking up in this circumstance, like to the Dean, for example, she, she's already been cast as having an attitude mm -hmm. even before he's gotten a word out. Mm -hmm. So she's not going to win mm -hmm. if she comes back again and tries to correct this man. And also right. he's the one who can decide whether or not she can stay in school. So she bites her tongue, but that has a cost. Mm -hmm. You know, That type of experience has a cost. So it's either something that we pay external or it's something that's internal that you are, you know, it's, it's like, what type of wound do you want to suffer? Do you want it, you know, you yeah. want someone to inflict a wound on you or are you just going to give yourself small little cuts throughout the day, you know? I know, I know. And this is like, it's a process that I, that I, I'm, one of the things I'm most proud about in Legendborn is being able to track Bree's interior experience of racism versus her exterior and when watching how that, how that weighs on a person over time. And it's uneven. And sometimes it comes from people you like, mm -hmm. uh, not just, you know, bad folks. Um, 
let's keep going. I feel like we have so many questions. Okay, what where where people are upvoting, which is helpful. Can y'all hear me now at all? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. we can okay. hear you. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. My whole computer just turned itself off. So um, that's this year. I'm pretty used to it at this point. Um, I was going to say, um, I think the like navigating the code switching and deciding when to object to racism and when to, you know, like sort of read the room and, and devote your energy in a different direction is so tied and throughout the book, so tied to place and to UNC in particular. Um, it's a school that obviously has a really dark history in a lot of ways. Um, and I was wondering, you mentioned that you weren't, you were thinking of not setting it at UNC specifically. Can you talk a little bit about the, the change in that decision and how you chose to represent um, the past of UNC and what that you know means to you? Yeah, um, I think I just realized one day that um, there would be benefit to parties that I didn't want to benefit if I didn't call it UNC. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's honestly, it's that simple. Uh, <laughs> and no. I was like, well, what we're not going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they don't deserve it. Do that. Um, but also, like, even beyond that, I just, uh, I realized something that when you're writing a book that's contemporary in fantasy and has fantasy elements, that um, one of the things that readers get to do, which is fun, um, is to be like, is this real or is this real? Is this real? What's real? What's fake? And in the, in the, you know, what's fantasy? What's, what can other people see? Can other people see that? And so the whole book is wrestling with this like perception of like Brie sees things, but nobody else does. Brie has a memory, but nobody else does. And, and so like that pattern of questioning is going out throughout the book. And I realized that I did not want people to question where she was. Like, I was like, I need, like, that's not a question I could have up in the air. And I didn't want people to be able to say, well, we know there's no hellhounds. And so maybe that table doesn't exist mm -hmm. or like we know that there's no um merlins who are wiping memories on campus so maybe that statue doesn't exist like i just didn't want to create um a question about those things maybe football you know maybe football parking didn't really happen on those graves uh no that's exactly what happened on those graves you know so i really felt like i i couldn't bring in those facts and call it something else i needed to just be able to say what it was um, and that's the same for all the microaggressions that Brie faces in the book. I made a choice to pull from my personal experience for every single one. So none of those were fictionalized, none of them. I have been, uh, maybe the setting was changed or who said it changed, but like the actual microaggressions, I was like, I'm gonna pull from my whole life mm -hmm. so that no one can point to those and be like, well, that would never happen. Mm -hmm. So it was choice of like, how do you balance what's fictional in a book like this? Um, and I realized that there was much more power in me calling it what it is and that I couldn't pull that punch. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, uh, I have a question here from Micah for both of you. Um, how does it feel to be able to contribute epic stories that center Black characters to the fantasy genre? Kwame, you start. It feels great. <laughs> it feels good. Like it's on the shelf. Uh, you can't ignore it, right? Uh, Legendborn is going to have a sticker on it, a uh, step toe sticker. It's going to be highlighted. And um, I just love that um, it'll be in, you know, Chapel Hill libraries. Um, and, you know, North Carolina libraries, and we will be able to, we being um, the majority, will be able to reconcile with what's in the book, with what Tracy was just talking about, right? Like, Brie is here, she's in your face, um, and she is delivering message after message after message, message either uh, via her actions or via her words or, you know, via any of the number of things that, that, that Brie accomplishes throughout the book um, for a, uh, just speaking about a local um, North Carolinian, um, I think it's phenomenal, right? I think it's absolutely phenomenal. I think that to have um, 
Bree and and the fantasy genre is just it's going to do so many wonderful things for both for both aspiring authors, right, who want to set uh, who want to do fantasy, black authors, um, young girl mm -hmm. uh, writers who want to talk about black girls and fantasy in the South, right? It's going to be wondrous. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I can't speak enough of uh, when I closed Legendborn. I didn't, you know, when I finished reading it for the first time, I think I bombarded Tracy's uh, either texts or DMs or chats or whatever. And I was just like, how dare you, right? Like, this is this is so good. This is wonderful. Um, I, I think I immediately stepped into uh, the interwebs and started demanding shows. I started demanding movies. I wanted graphic novels. I think that um, Bree deserves to be in every format and every medium delivered to everyone's eyeballs uh, on a 24-7 news cycle uh, because it's just, you know, the character, the change that she undergoes, the power that she wields, um, it's just, I don't know, it's its phenomenal. And so putting Bree into, you know, this, this genre of fantasy, it's just... It's legendary. It is. It is legendary, Tracy. You did it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like, what do I say? Thank you. I appreciate it. Like, I feel like Kwame just like advocated for the the Bree universe. Um, it has to happen. The Bree verse. The Bree it has to happen. Thank you. Um. Let's see, we have a few more minutes. Maybe we get through a couple questions. Yeah, um, I have a question here from Michelle about queer representation in the book. Um, mm -hmm. Did you struggle at all with deciding how to approach it or did you have a very like clear, this is how I want to represent queerness in Legendborn? Um, I didn't really struggle very much. Um, with that call because I knew that um, there, you know, Greer uh, has a moment where they're talking about their experience and that people talk about them too. Um, so I knew that I wanted to show allyship between marginalized parties and marginalized kids, because I do think that that happens, you know, particularly we're talking about uh, a young black woman in a primarily white space I found often that I was connecting with other people in that space who were marginalized um, in a different way, perhaps, but understood what it meant to be, um, you know, pushed to the pushed to the margins in in conversations and not be centered in books and stuff like that in class or whatever. So I wanted to have that um, connection made, but I didn't really ever. It, it, like plan or anticipate any homophobia. Um, it's not that I don't think these characters experience it in other spaces. And I think Legendborn doesn't suggest that they don't. I think it, they all, I think Legendborn asserts that they don't experience it here. Like, mm -hmm. like within the lodge, within their found family, within the order, that is not what's happening um, for them. And I, I think partly that was like these, kids are descendants of knights and they're literally out fighting monsters all the time and saving the world and trying to save the world and they're holy warriors essentially um i'm really not about to have them be at each other with some homophobia because like whatever no um and even my experience at, at carolina i was fortunate enough to be in a, a in a not a knights of the round table but in an organization that was um really diverse in that way and and it just it wasn't there and I, I wanted to show that there are spaces where that doesn't exist um yeah so yeah it wasn't super it wasn't a super struggle I knew that I wanted to acknowledge that homophobia exists in the world and I think that happens maybe twice in the book but it's not something I felt desired to show for these characters Experience. Yeah, especially from peers I think that's really important to you know show that for, at least from their immediate circle of the people who they choose to spend time with, you know, that's not, that's yeah. not where the antagonism is coming from. If, if, it, if there is any, it's coming from people who are older and um, 
I think who are pretty clearly portrayed as being out of touch, which is, yeah. you know, a good message to send. <laughs> so well yeah. done. Yeah, I mean, I want a book that, you know, I want a book that uh, in 20 or 30 years, people can pick up. And I don't think, I hope in many more spaces in 20 or 30 years, that's how it feels. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that marking a book with, you know, some some scene uh just to, to say that i did uh, it doesn't feel right but i but i will say that like there's plenty of scenes right where Bree's marginalization as a black woman um comes up and that that was that was also a choice to say like there are there's a point to be made there right that like among these peers um homophobia may not be an issue but race sure is still right yeah um, all right, before we wrap up, I'm sure there are a ton of questions about process. Um, so I'm just going to sort of summarize those into process question. Um, can you each talk a little bit about your writing process, how you world build, how, like, what's the, what does it look like to come up with a book? Do you have an outline? Do you, are you a pantser or a planner? Like all those types of things. Each of you take like a minute, go. <laughs> Um, I am a planter, so I plot, I like to think of myself as a plotter. I thought when I first started writing fiction that I was a plotter. I plotted Legendborn all the way through, through to the end in an outline and then threw out like 80% of it because turns out I love and need to be able to discover stuff along the way. Along the way. So I think right, right now what I do is I have a big outline of the major elements. Um, I do structure my stories in like a four act structure, um, but I don't hold you know hard and fast to that. It just helps me think about beats. Um, and then I uh, go back and outline in more detail an eighth at a time. So I'll write an eighth and then sort of poke my head up like a meerkat and look around and be like, is this good? Is this where I want to be? Do I like this? And then I'll re-outline the next, like about an eighth uh, of the book and then do it that way. Uh, yeah, so I um, I uh, light three candles in a specific sequential order, uh, forming a triangle with myself at the center in which I then cry for 25 minutes specifically. <laughs> Um, before every session, just draining myself of all, you know, fear and emotional vulnerability um, so that I can clear my head to put that onto the page. Uh, and uh, then, you know, I make coffee, I clean, um, straighten up my yeah. office. Um, and then by that time, I think it's like the baby is ready to be cared for. And so then writing just becomes um you know a mishmash of scrambled sticky notes and text to myself on my phone it's just what everyone does really oh my gosh yep, that's, that's a process that's that's the process that is quite quite a process yeah. all of that just all of that is just to say that um there is no one specific process right like you are going to um write and create and produce a story in the manner that best suits you. And if it's yeah. a little bit at a time, if it's all in one big lump, um, you know, if it's over a coffee or beer or wine or, you know, whatever, um, you're going to do it in a fashion that best suits you. And that's, you know, do what makes you comfortable. Don't do something that makes you uncomfortable or stresses you out, right? Like the world is stressful enough. Um, write in a manner that is comforting to you. And the book will be done when the book is done. Yes. And I would also say write in the manner that helps you produce the story. So mm. there's all sorts of techniques that I can adopt and try out, but they don't always lead me to actually getting words on the page or getting them done in a way that feels comfortable. So definitely do what you need to do so that you can find the space and find the story and, and finish it, mm -hmm. um, which is important. Um I want to, is it okay if we, if we like take another 10 minutes? Is that okay? It's fine with me. Fun. What are we doing? I know we thought we were going to stop at like 7.15, but is that, Kwame, what, why are you looking at me? No, I'm, I'm wondering what are we going to do in these additional special bonus oh, 10 minutes? Oh, no, answer more questions. Oh. We, there are so many. <laughs> there are so what many. What do you think 
I thought we were gonna do like like you know super trope tastic. You know, you were gonna tell me what your favorite trope is, and you know we're gonna hash thought, it out. I thought we were gonna do that too. Um, <laughs> it's fine. We'll just have to do a we'll just have to do a second event. Exactly. We we'll have to come back. We we'll we'll yes. have to do that. Um. Yeah, I do want to answer a few more questions because I know the chat is popping off. No, and there's absolutely. only one person in the chat who is popping off. And she knows who she is, and just she who will not be named. Um, if it's we, fine. If we name a person and we call them out, then we have to produce their book. That's the rule. So, was it Danielle Clayton? Oh, it, it it is always Danielle Clayton. It is always <laughs> Danielle Clayton. She is like the spark that just pops off right next to the stick of dynamite. And then she blames the dynamite when it goes off. She's like, I didn't blow up. You know, I'm just a spark here. The fuse is the one who blew up the dynamite. And it's just like, it's, that's, that's, that's Danielle. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. But, trope. okay. Yes. Trope? Yeah, go for it. Let's talk about one. We can do one trope thing and then we'll go back to questions. So okay. favorite trope. What is your favorite trope? Tell me. I want to know. Mm, so I don't have a favorite, favorite, favorite. Um, but I will say, I mean, Love Triangle will always get me. Always. No. Um, no surprise there. Um, and I really, I people ask me if I like enemies to lovers or friends to lovers or whatever. And I feel like sometimes it's just coded questions to get me to be like, they want to find out who's in game in Legendborn, which mm -hmm. like, I am never going to say out loud. Um, I don't even know if there really is like the right answer there mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like which of those I like, but I do like relationships that change. And mm -hmm. I don't know that's like the meta trope of all those mm -hmm. enemies to lovers, friends to lovers, lovers to enemies, like yeah, all that stuff. Like I love that. I love it when um, a relationship just like switches mm -hmm. and then there's a shift. And all of a sudden, the dynamic is different. Mm -hmm. And I think you see that too in Legendborn. That like you know, some like some some monumental thing happens, and all of a sudden, these two characters are looking at each other differently. Mm -hmm. I love that. Stuff. Like, shoot it into my veins. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I uh, I agree. I think um, I don't even know if this is really a trope, but I just like. And, and, you know, everyone knows this because I talk about it all the time. I like the pining, right? Like, I want, I like the mutual pining. And there's something, um, there is something preventing these, these two or three or however many knuckleheads from, like, fitting together in the correct orientation of the puzzle, right? They are just jabbing at each other and it's failing for some reason. It could be something external, right? Like, it could be, um, I'm a big sucker for duty getting in the way like um they have yeah. obligations to some other party a job yeah. a mission yeah. and they cannot because this will jeopardize everything um and i also like you know that they're just complete not smart people and they're just not picking up the signal, right? Like they're both shooting the same signal at each other, but they are like magnets and they have their polarities reversed. And so they keep repelling because they don't remember to turn themselves around. It's just like, it doesn't work, right? They don't, they're not smart. And you're just reading the book and you're like, oh my gosh, like, Is what are you, you doing? <laughs> Is that how you felt when you read uh, Lost Stars by Claudia Gray? Lost Stars. Oh my God, we could spend an entire another event talking about it's Lost Stars. Book. Like in that book, I feel like it's like it's what you just described. Where you're like these two. You're just like these mm -hmm. two. Just, can you just get it so, together? <laughs> yes. However, so Claudia does a thing where she, that's kind of result. They kind of figure it out. I think I want to yeah. say within the first quarter, first third of the book, right? Um, yeah. I, so I just finished reading uh, a book, Winter's Orbit, that just came out, um, a space opera romance or whatever. And they're just like throughout the whole book, they're just, you know, two left hands trying to perform a handshake and they keep like smacking each other instead. And it's just yeah. like, yeah. you guys are not getting it together. Anyway, that's that's what I like, you know. So <laughs> maybe you, have you watched Bridgerton? Um, oh, that's, again, that's a whole nother conversation. So I watched the first two episodes of Bridgerton and mm -hmm. here is something personal that I will reveal to you all, okay? 
um, if there is um, token diversity within a media, right? And then aspects of that diversity are then demonized. I cannot finish mm -hmm. watching, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a whole entire, if 80% of your cast is, you know, black, uh, is queer, is marginalized in some fashion, then okay, then, you know, you, you know, you can, it, it's understand, I, I can understand why, you know, this would be a horrifically abusive person because people like that exist in life. However, right. if you have token diversity and part of that token diversity is abusive, I am not going to finish watching it just because I'm not, a, I'm just not a fan of that. So the show could be great. The show could be wonderful, but, um, and, and I understand what they did to try and become more inclusive, but this is why you need more people, not only in the writer's room, but in all levels of, you know, organizing this media property, because at some point someone has to say the optics on this do not look great. Right. Yeah. And I understand it was a major part of the, of the, the, the books, right. I understand how that, um, impacts the character's life going forward and how why they become who they become right but when you then turn you know when when you when you make that person a character a marginalized character you then bring in a whole another level a whole another layer that has to be parsed through and i am not going to be the one to do that parsing i love it for you if you enjoy the show i'm not telling you not to watch the show it's just i just can't do it it's well, it's a me. lot. I was just saying, it's a lot of pining, but they do. There are a lot of weird decisions on that show about oh, certain, first... things, certain things are just ignored, and other times it's mm -hmm. like it, it over explained, but in a way that doesn't make sense. So, yeah, I good on you. To... Good on you if you love the show. Watch it. Uh, we, you are allowed to love what you love. Uh, you don't have to justify it to me. Absolutely. Totally get you. <laughs> Um, can we get a couple minutes to talk about next projects? Because everyone wants to know. Tracy, book two. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what, what, what would you like to know? Um, <laughs> so, uh, book two is underway. I'm working on it now. Um, uh, book two, the title and the release date uh, have not been announced by the publisher. Um, and that's what will need to happen for that information to be public. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's underway, it's well underway. Um, you know, I, I think I've said already that there's uh, three books planned right now. Um, it was, Originally, it was conceived of as a as a trilogy, the Legendborn trilogy. Um, book two details about it, so I'm trying to be consistent with what I say because I just I know like what's going to happen is like she said this one thing, and like there's a wiki now that and there, the wiki has a section that's like the things Tracy has said, mm -hmm. and then the things Tracy hasn't said, and I'm like, y'all, <laughs> there's some stuff in the tra the things Tracy hasn't said where I was like, oh, is that no, no, I'm not writing that. Like I, I had a question. <laughs> Um, so things about it. Um, so it picks up not not long after the end of book one. Um, uh, someone in I will say someone in the chat asked about like, are we still going to be spending a lot of time at UNC? And I will um, say uh, not quite. Um, that there is going to be more exposure to other members of the order. Um, if you not to spoil anything, but at the end of the book, um, there's talk about. Um, you know, the next phase of what's going on and that, that there are going to be certain parties that are going to need to come on board and we have not met them yet, but you will meet them very soon in at the beginning of the next book. And then um, you get to see more use of powers on all parts, on all sides. Um, so Bree, Cell, um, you get to meet other Merlins. So that's been a lot of fun, actually. That's been the most fun is just being able to show the broader Merlin hierarchy. Like, I think we have a pretty good handle on what's happening with the Legendborn and the Scions and a little bit of the Vassals in those groups. But um, you really only get to meet like three Merlins um, in the entire book. So that's, um, 
and inter and Brie only interacts with like really interacts with like two. So it'll it's it's fun to show what else is going on in terms of that population. Rami? What? I'm next, next projects. I'm You've got a lot. Down, You've got a lot happening this year. I'm taking down notes on what what Tracy uh <laughs> You're gonna be. It's like you're gonna be on the wiki later. Today. Yeah, I I, I, update, I update the wiki. So what Tracy said, y'all. What she said. Um, uh, I don't know what's happening. Um, Tristan three is releasing this year. Um, Last Gate of the Emperor uh, that I co-wrote with Prince Yoel McConan, uh comes out in May. It's like three months. It's less than three months away, and I am studiously avoiding the calendar because it's blowing my mind. Um, and then Black Boy Joy, Black Boy Joy, uh, 17 short stories about jo the joys of black boyhood, um, comes out this summer and I'm super thrilled about that just because, um, yeah, I've, I've got to read each and every one of those stories. They're absolutely fantastic. And I just love the writers that we pulled together, you know, from across, from nonfiction, from YA, from you know, established and middle grade, from prose to comics, like to be able to tell the stories in this format, it's it's super exciting. So you know, a few books, just, just that's it. Just sprinkle them across the literary timeline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, how about we do one more question before we wrap? Um, what are y'all reading right now that you're excited about? I know we've name dropped a lot of books, but we have. Um, so I'm reading um, an early copy of a book that's coming out this summer called Blood Like Magic by Lizelle Sanbury. Oof. Yes. So, jealous. Jealous I much. Have, yeah, I have a couple of books uh, that have not come out yet sitting in my inbox. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll mention that one in particular. Um, and uh, what else am I reading? I'm back to reading Webtoons. You should have never left. Webtoons are great. I know. I left for a while because I was on deadline mm -hmm. and I was, like, I was compulsively going back like in reading updates. But like I'm actually I might restart Lore Olympus um, because I want to get back to that. And then mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple other Webtoons I was reading. If you haven't read Webtoons, there uh, it's an app and there are uh, they're like web comics, but they're optimized for your phone and they they're just a delight. And the art is all really interesting and some of the storytelling styles are just amazing and doing things with web comics that I didn't even know was possible. And once you pop, you just can't stop. It's just like it's like, really hard. It's, it's like I'm. I feel like I've just. I've just. I should have warned people before I recommended it. Like, you might get addicted. Tailor made <laughs> for binging. Um, I so I am reading a you know several um, drafts, several works in progress from different um, authors. But I think what I'm most one of the things that I'm most excited about that I just got. Um, is uh, The Conductors, um, which is um, uh, it's written by Nicole Glover. It comes out next month, I believe. And it's, you know, the 19th century um, black couple mystery. There's magic. Um, and if you know anything about the time period, no, this is, you know, the Reconstruction era, you know, slavery's done, hooray, you know, things are, you know, are supposedly supposed to be better for black people. And, you know, there are, um, I don't know, it's just something about a black married couple, you know, black married magicians that are solving, you know, mysteries um, at that time period that is just absolutely fantastic. So it's the conductors, it comes out uh, March, oh my God, March 2nd. So that's like what, two, three weeks oh or God. whatever. Yeah, so, close. yeah, that's what I I'm might reading. have to pull together a big, um, Web page of all the books you mentioned, so that everybody can buy them from Flyleaf. Do it. <laughs> the chat. The chat also has a lot of really good titles in there. Yeah, um, I will. I'll grab them out and I'll make a a web page and link it in the chat. Um. All right. Well, I think we're gonna wrap. Um. If if that's all right with you guys. Um. Yeah. Thank you both so so much for joining us tonight. Um. It's been such a treat to have you all talk. Uh, truly, your books are some of our absolute staff favorites, so it really means a lot. Um, and of course, once we are able to do in-person events, I hope you'll come back for, you'll have other things out by then, so I'll make sure to 
to to get you back in the store for a real in-person event. I'm sure all these people would like to actually see you in person. Um, so once again, um, if you would like to buy books from these authors, you can do so by clicking the link just below our faces and you can search any of the books you heard that you were interested about, it heard about that you were interested in tonight. And I'll try to put together um, a web page of all those titles. And before you go, we have signed copies of Legendborn right now. Um, Tracy was able to stop by earlier this week and sign. So that's an exclusive. Uh, any copies that you order right now are going to be signed. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Kwame. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, thank you Chapel Hill. Very sorry for the technical difficulties. And all thank good. you, everybody, for watching. Have a good thank night. You all. Thank you so much. Bye, y'all.